So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Center for Education and Research on Aging and Health, or SARA, here at Lakehead University, I'd like to welcome you to our speaker session today on using digital stories in compassionate communities. Okay. I'm Stephanie Hendrickson. I am a knowledge broker at SARA. Thanks. That's good. We would like to begin uh, by acknowledging that Lakehead University is located on their traditional territory um, of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. And our speakers today, Mary Lou, John, and Anne, are joining us from Ottawa and area, and the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We honor the traditional custodians of these lands and elders, past, present, and emerging. And we also acknowledge that you all are joining from your respective traditional territories as well. So we're very excited to have Mary Lou Kelly, John Cosgrove, and Anne Barkley with us today to share about their work on digital stories and also to view some of those stories together. Um, we just ask that while we're playing the digital stories, if you can keep your cameras turned off, um, otherwise, we do encourage you to keep your camera on um, and hopefully we'll hear some of your thoughts and reflections on the digital stories. So just um, your start and stop video button are found at the bottom left hand uh, corner of your screen, as well as the mute button. Um, if you can remain muted uh, throughout the presentation as well, um, unless you are interacting with our presenters, of course. And if you do have any difficulties hearing the stories when they're playing, if you can please um, try adjusting the volume on your computer or device just to make sure that you do have it turned up. Um, and without any further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers to you and turn it over to them. So no stranger to many of you joining us today, uh, Mary Lou Kelly, MSW PhD, has been engaged in practice teaching and research in gerontology and palliative care since 1972. And major research contributions were in rural and First Nations communities and long-term care homes. After 35 years as a professor at Lakehead University Thunder Bay, she retired in 2015. And she and her husband relocated to Ottawa to be with family and volunteer with Compassionate Ottawa. And since 2021, Mary Lou is currently a member uh, working on the Health Canada funded project, strengthening the palliative approach in long-term care. And John Cosgrove, MSW, has spent his career in family services um, and has been a volunteer with Compassionate Ottawa also since 2015. He's one of the storytellers in the Faces of Health collection um, of stories and one of the stories that we'll view today. And Anne Barkley lives in the beautiful village of Morrisburg on the St. Lawrence River. She's married to Jack, a retired principal, and they have two grown children, Scott and Laura, a Lakehead alumni, um, and three grandchildren. Anne is, is a retired teacher, and she spends time volunteering in her community with her church, hospice, local hospital, and school. So welcome to you all very much. Uh, thank you for being here. And Mary Lou, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. And it's uh, a delight to be doing this for Sarah and for uh, all the people that are participating. Um, I see some very familiar faces and it's lovely. Uh, it's lovely to see you all and, and keep in touch and share some of the things that John and I uh, have been doing. So I thought I would just begin with a few background remarks so that you understand the context of um, the stories that you will see and um, we can discuss them. But I thought I'd begin because this, the title of the session today is using digital stories in compassionate communities. So- Go ahead, video's off, mute's off. I thought that I would begin by letting you know um, how we think about a compassionate community. Dr. Alan Keller here, who is the author of the Compassionate City Charter, states that a compassionate community is one where its residents recognize and care for one another in times of crisis and loss. And this is not simply a task for health and social services, but everyone's responsibility. So Compassionate Ottawa is a volunteer organization that established itself about five years ago here in Ottawa to really 
embrace and try and promote the vision of a compassionate community here. So Compassionate Ottawa is committed to playing a leadership role to foster a community model of care, working in collaboration with healthcare providers. The model is built on the principles of community development, where it is the community that determines its needs and develops its path to help deal with the needs. And the role of Compassionate Ottawa is to help facilitate this process. I know that Thunder Bay is uh, actively working at developing Thunder Bay's own compassionate community model. So some of you uh, will be involved with that. So the sponsor of these digital stories um, was primarily a funding organization called the Canadian Frailty Network. Um, they fund um, research and what's called knowledge translation or education in the area of aging and frailty. So they, they provided uh, $25,000 to Compassionate Ottawa to support the development of these stories. Uh, we also, at, as part of the requirement, uh, got some matching funding. We got uh, some funding from Health Canada to help support the French language um, stories. So two of the stories, we made seven. Two of them are uh, in the French language and the rest of them are subtitled in French. And we got some funding from two regional geriatric programs um, of Southeastern Ontario and the Seniors Care Network. So there was a lot of uh, excitement and, and investment um, in the, the work that you're going to see today. Why did we make them? Well, consistent with um, my description of uh, Compassionate Ottawa's role of fostering and facilitating um, understanding and adoption of compassionate community principles, we really wanted various resources that can be used uh, as a conversation starter. Uh, I think you'll find that these digital stories, which um, are very approachable and can be used in a wide variety of settings uh, to mobilize uh, people's understanding and increase people's comfort level with having end of life conversations. And that of course is the first step in behavior change is to really develop a better understanding and comfort level uh, with issues that sometimes are not commonly talked about. So I'm going to turn this over to John now. He is going to introduce the stories to you. John? Yes, well, good afternoon. And uh, as Mary Lou said, it's uh, fun to see some familiar names and familiar uh, faces. And I, I've even seen a couple of faces of uh, other storytellers that uh, I was involved with uh, uh, in years gone by. So, uh, yeah, so what, as Mary Lou mentioned, there, there are uh, seven stories in all. Uh, you're gonna see just three of them today. Um, and they really do work well as a conversation starter. That's what we were hoping for. And uh, the indications already uh, in, in some of the work we've done is that, uh, you know, when people hear a personal story, they, they feel invited to respond. They feel invited to, in many cases, to help tell their own story. So for example, I uh, facilitated a group with um, a cardiac rehab uh, education group, uh, and it was a group of men. And uh, they had no difficulty whatsoever uh, giving examples from their own life uh, to, that uh, made the conversation go uh, fairly readily. So that's, that's kind of two real benefits that, uh, that, that I see. And uh, we're certainly hoping that as people will use them with the groups that they are familiar with or participate in or family and friends that uh, 
we, we'll get widespread uh, use of them. So uh, in a minute, we'll just sit back and uh, enjoy three of the stories. Uh, afterwards, I'll uh, invite you just to make a, 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 a comment, a word or a phrase uh, about uh, what you thought or felt during the story. So um, let, let's just look at the stories and, uh, and we'll have a bit of discussion afterwards. And I would further just encourage you to put some of these reactions in the chat yep. as we go along. Stephanie, there's some sort of black blob. Oh, maybe it's gone, good. Let's go to full screen. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to balance the wishes of your loved one who has died and the needs of your loved ones who are left to grieve. My dad fell and broke his hip. After surgery for a partial hip replacement, he faced weeks of rehab to walk and climb stairs again so he could return to his home. As I look back at this time in rehab, it was a wonderful gift to me as I was able to spend many hours alone with him. It was just me and my dad, no distractions of everyday life. He always loved the outdoors, so I would push his wheelchair out to the garden where I sat on the swing and we talked. He shared memories growing up in Ottawa about his four sisters, but especially his time in the Merchant Marines during World War II as he traveled the world. These were stories I had never heard growing up. We laughed together as he told me about getting his first tattoo. It was after crossing the equator, and he and his shipmates went to a questionable parlor that certainly would never have passed inspection here. He also had some pretty strong ideas about what should happen after he died cremation and scatter the ashes on Frenchman Lake in northern Ontario where our family camp was located. No casket, no visitation, no flowers, no funeral, and no obituary in the paper. Being with him in his last days and hearing how strongly he felt about his last wishes being followed, I had no problem carrying them through. What I didn't anticipate was the reaction of his grandchildren. They were upset there wasn't a funeral or gathering to remember their grandfather. It was like his life didn't happen, didn't matter. They decided to meet in Sudbury for a weekend to celebrate his life, reminisce about their memories of his time with them, and say goodbye. I wasn't able to attend, but that was okay, as this was their time to grieve together in their own way. I think my dad would be proud of his children, who carried out his last wishes, and proud of his grandchildren, who needed time together to honor a man who had touched their lives.
Oh, the good old hockey game, it's the best game you can name. And the best game you can name, it's the good old hockey game. In 2001, my wife Jerry was diagnosed with cancer. We began a seven year roller coaster ride of shock, hope, disappointment, hope again, then an awareness that no further treatment was possible. At one point during that journey, we decided that I would return to playing hockey, something I really enjoyed. So I went back to the arena. As I walked toward the dressing room, apprehensive about meeting the players I hadn't seen for many months, I expected an awkward silence, unsure of what I would say or what the men might say. I entered the dressing room, and to my surprise, a guy at the end of the room shouted, Welcome back, John. And two others added, Yes, good to have you back. Then the comedian of the group said, Sit down and tell us how many goals you're going to score today. And they all laughed, because I'm not a prolific scorer. The tension I felt was gone and I focused on having fun on the ice. I've been playing hockey for 70 years and have been in many, many dressing rooms. I realized then the room was more than just a place to get changed. So much more happens there. The men supported me in a variety of ways, some with a quiet nod, with concern on their faces, others with humor, and a couple of them privately on the way out of the arena with an offer to help Jerry or I if and when we needed it. While playing with the same group of men for years, I saw them support others individually and collectively. Four men who had terminal illnesses and could no longer play periodically returned to the dressing room to visit teammates, to hear the banter and have a beer. They too were welcomed back. Also, we once phoned a former player from the dressing room. He was to have life-threatening surgery the next day, and we offered best wishes, hope, and laughter. As players, we spent four hours a week together in the dressing room. As the years passed, men began arriving earlier and earlier to play and stayed longer afterwards. We learned how we might support each other and were less awkward talking about difficult issues. And when the time came for Jerry and I, the guys were all there for me. Senior men's hockey game, it's the best game you can name. And the best game you can name, it's the senior men's hockey game. Second period, things are really slowing down. And the players dash with the skates of flash as Daryl taking a dive. Four nights a week, Pasquale will sneak out to feel alive. And can When I was a little girl, growing up in the Netherlands, dying was very much a part of living. I experienced this firsthand in my own family because my aunt took care of my Oma and Opa at the end of their lives so they could die at home, surrounded by loved ones. My aunt instilled in me the feeling to help other people who needed to be cared for. I loved her very much. We always felt very comfortable talking about death and dying in my family. And when my dad was dying of cancer, he was cared for at home. I remember getting the call early in the morning that he had died. 
After taking care of our toddler and four-year-old, I left them with my husband and drove 30 minutes to see my dad and help my mom. The roads were very quiet this early, and I thought, why did he have to die this young at 63? I remembered all the times he played with me and read me stories when I was very little. He was such a hands-on dad. Dad was so disappointed when they told him that the cancer treatments weren't working anymore and that there was nothing more they could do. He had a difficult time expressing his feelings and wouldn't talk about it. So I didn't really have a chance to say goodbye. Helping my mom washing him and dressing him in clean pajamas was my chance to say goodbye and let him go. This is a ritual as old as time. And even though I was only 27 then, I felt so full of old wisdom. He looked very peaceful and we were all relieved he didn't have to suffer anymore. Helping the elderly became part of my life. These days I volunteer for a local hospice and offer companionship to palliative clients. We share stories about life and talk about dying. We also laugh a lot. I have become a very good listener and often that is all that is needed. Okay, I think just taking a moment to uh, reflect on those three stories, you'll notice they're, they're very different in content. Um, I had selected a few names to call upon just to give a word or a phrase um, as to what you thought and felt watching the videos. Uh, I don't think I really need to, as I look at some of the names here, I don't think we'll have difficulty with the uh, offering, but uh, it, we'll, we'll see. So does anyone want to uh, step forward and, and say what they thought or felt? Of course, I have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought they were very powerful, very different. I, I, people are given the opportunity to talk about death. It's amazing how interested people really are if you give them the chance. As, as recently as, as last evening, I was at um, a, a social gathering and there was somebody there, a physician actually, a young physician, who wanted to ask me what it was like to be with someone who died because she cared for dying people, but she'd never been there when somebody actually died. And she was very interested in, in hearing my stories about what I'd seen and what I'd experienced. So it's, it's fascinating what doors will open if we just crack them open a bit. And the stories seem a wonderful way to do that. So well done, all of them.
Okay, thank you, Susan. And what a terrific message to all of us. <laughs> I can uh, maybe offer some of the stuff that's in the chat. Uh, there were some, um, so this is from Carrie Lynn Durant, touching and impactful, wonderful use of first person narrative, winding around the stills, just beautiful. Uh, Kathy Cordes Miller says, love the choice of music for this video, familiar to many and not distracting from the narrative. Barb Fugel saying, says, story confirms much of my work with families on hospice. Holly Prince, recognizing the impact of music on storytelling. Kathy again, um, I shared this digital story in my social work class when we discussed social networks, and it was so well received. Jill Marcella appreciated how she was able to turn negative event of hospitalization into an opportunity with her dad and learning more about who he was. Carrie Lynn, wonderful levity, loved the image of him walking up the hallway profound. Such a poignant reminder that there's life right until death. Jill highlights the importance of connection and how important it is in sickness too. Nancy Angus, so wonderful to have friends to share life's journey with you. Cassandra Fernandez, appreciate the way they've made a socially supportive place to come together and be there for one another. They're, they're just for more than just hockey but maybe without the game and the team, they wouldn't have had the same place and this kind of conversation and support. Carrie Lynn, beautiful example of knowledge transfer through life experience, value of continuing bonds that cross familial lines. Cassandra, interesting, the very different experiences and comfort levels was speaking about dying. Shauna Fossum, I felt so full with old wisdom very impactful, and I agree with Carrie Lynn. This is a wonderful example of knowledge transfer in life. Holly, love the choice of pictures and photography. The black and white brown images portray the feeling in a different way, almost nostalgic. And Nancy Angus, compassion, connecting, recognizing wishes. So those were comments from the chat. Yeah. Would anyone else like to uh, comment? Yes, I would. I'm Roberta Gori. Okay. Hi. Hi. And I have simple words for each film. Last wishes made me feel cut off from the family. Dying dressing room, I saw team building. And dying is part of living. Two different things came to me, door to living, the same door to death. Or what we think while in life will take to death. Okay, well, thank you. Thank and, you. And Kevin, you had your, your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, one of our 93 year old clients is from Estonia and she escaped Estonia the day ahead of the Russian invasion in the context of World War II. Mm -hmm. And so what's been happening in Ukraine has really brought a lot of things right to the surface for her. And for the last few days, she's been telling stories to our PSWs and the people caring for her of what she felt and, and uh, how her parents reacted and how her siblings reacted. And, uh, I was just thinking that it, it would be an excellent time to be capturing some of those stories with her as a storyteller, because it's very raw for her right now. She's not sleeping well at night because she's spending too much time watching the news feed and, and relating so personally to what's going on. Yeah. I'm just thinking that it's possible that if we were to allow her the opportunity to, to save some of those stories for her children and grandchildren, that it uh, might bring her a little comfort and maybe even help her sleep at night. Mm -hmm. 
That's a terrific yeah. idea. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I, uh, I would just emphasize again our, you know, our goal is uh, to, to have the stories used as conversation starters and, and uh, like examples of people you've given so far, it, it, it's so easy for people to, when they're invited to uh, um, share a story, to get into t uh, uh, telling one themselves, you know? So um, thank you all for uh, sharing. And if you wish to continue adding the odd comment, please uh, go ahead and we appreciate it. Um, so we have a couple more things in the chat. Um, it's nice to see the importance in different ways for loved ones to say their goodbyes. Cassandra's asking, I wonder, John, if you could speak a bit about the experience of telling your story and um, I'm gonna let that, put that on the back burner until after Anne has a, uh, her opportunity to talk about what it was like when she made the story, but you know, John, you could come back to yep, that. Yep. And then Nancy asks about gathering groups to listen to the stories. And I will speak about that uh, at the end. So. Mary Lou, I just saw Carrie Lynn also has her hand up. Oh. There, oh, there's Terry Lynn, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, as if you haven't heard enough. Um, I wanted to just chime in after Kevin's comment because as somebody who uses digital storytelling in the research and my dissertation that I'm currently working on, Kathy, please take note that I just said that. Um, I wanted to say that not only are these wonderful stories um, uh, in terms of legacy for the family. They're so such gifts uh, for the storyteller themselves. Uh, I think my experience has been that it can be very empowering to tell these stories because really there's always a story and so much of the process of telling your story can offer um, catharsis, can offer um, connection, can offer gifts for, for oneself really in the process of, of telling, retelling, remembering the stories and recounting them to people who will will carry them forward. So I think I think what Kevin has said is it really resonates that, that there's so much power there to be to be held. If I can uh, just build on that with a personal example, um, I think a very very powerful thing that we can get either from the stories or an audio tape is the person's voice, and. Um, you know, my parents have both died, um, but we were very fortunate that um, we had an audio tape of my father being interviewed uh, at the time of his retirement. And that is something that when I listen to that audio tape and I hear his voice, it is such a powerful reconnection. And then when my mother who died during COVID, although not of COVID, um, she um, had made an audio tape with, with um, about two years before her death. And again, having that audio tape in which she recounts much of her life experience is, is such a, a precious thing uh, to have as a legacy document. Uh, so, I, I just want to emphasize, you know, what everybody is saying that that uh, these things are very, very highly valued. Okay. So um, I think then maybe what we'll do is uh, I'm going to call on Anne, and Anne is going to share a little bit uh, from her own point of view about the experience of. Um, making the story. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mary Lou. Um, I'm just, as I'm sitting here looking at all the different faces from all across the country, um, I'm thinking Zoom has been such a wonderful gift for us that we can do things that we wouldn't normally do if we had to be there in person. Though I would have loved to have had a, a ticket to fly to Thunder Bay to do this in person and uh, be able to see your beautiful city again. Uh, our daughter went there to university, so I know the wonderful parts of, uh, of Thunder Bay. 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to share with you my experience of uh, creating uh, the story. I was approached by Mary Lou um, after I uh, participated in another project that she was doing at Compassion at Ottawa. We did a book chat. Um, with a, a group from Dundas uh, County Hospice. And the book that we used was by uh, Kathy Cordes Miller, uh, talking about Death Won't Kill You. Uh, if you haven't read the book, I highly recommend it. Wonderful resource. And uh, so she approached me to be part of this project of creating a digital story. Um, now, had COVID not been uh, here, I probably would have said to her, no, thank you. Um, I'm too busy because when I retired in a small community, everybody knows that. So you get asked to do all kinds of uh, wonderful volunteering opportunities. So I was very, very busy prior to COVID, but now I had all kinds of time. So um, she gave me a link to John's story that was created for the community in Thunder Bay about him being the taxi driver for people that would come to Thunder Bay from the far north for uh, appointments, medical appointments and things. And as I was watching his story, I thought to myself, yeah, I think I can do this. So I'm going to call her and say, yes, I'm going to take this on. Um, so <clears throat> our first meeting was on Zoom with uh, Story Center Canada. And uh, I met the six other people who were going to do their stories. And I was struck by how diverse the group was that had been drawn together to do this. And I also, during the process, was struck by how open they were to share of themselves as they were writing and doing this, this whole thing. Um, our homework after that first Zoom meeting was to come up with an idea for a story. So uh, after a lot of thinking, I thought, okay, I'm going to share a story about an encounter I had at the Tim Hortons here in Morrisburg. And um, after sharing the story at that meeting and hearing other people's, I left not really feeling content with my idea. So um, we had office hours that uh, Rani, who was working the project with us, we could book times with her and um, so I booked a time with her and with uh, another with her co-workers we sat down and I shared my second idea and after I'd shared it um, somebody said well gee there's lots and lots of energy with this story and uh, someone else said um, you actually look excited telling this story and I thought who who would have thought talking about death and dying is exciting but that's what um, she had said to me. So I went away with that and I realized, okay, that's going to be my story. So the next step was to come with a script and we had to keep the script within uh, two to three minutes or sorry, three to four minutes. And um, which was very daunting for me because my first script I'm sure was 10 minutes long. So you had to really cut it down with lots of writes and rewrites, I, I got it down and uh, we came together and we shared our scripts with one another and gave feedback. And uh, so with notes in hand from the feedback, I went back to do some writing and rewriting, lots of crumpled paper on the floor because um, I like to do things in writing it out in longhand. I, um, I'm not one to type it on the computer and I'm sure Ronnie, Ranny was the, the only person that sent a long-handed written script was myself that I scanned and sent to her. I didn't even have it on the computer. Um, so we, um, we also had to collect pictures and or images to bring to the next meeting. That was daunting for me because I had to go through years and years of pictures that I had. Um, and of course you get sidetracked with memories and going down this lane and this rabbit hole, but um, I also couldn't find specific pictures that I wanted that I knew were out there. So I put a call out to family and received a, a number of pictures that I didn't have and now have in my collection. Um, we also needed to choose a piece of music for the background, um, which was very easy for me because um, my dad played the piano by ear. And I think it was a stress release for him. He would come home from work he, uh, and play, or at noontime, he would even come and play. And one of the pieces that he played quite often was Moonlight Sonata. So I, that's the one I chose. And a, a little side note here, I found, from, found out from my sister-in-law when she views the, the, viewed the video that uh, my brother learned how to play the beginning of this piece. And when they would go out socially to a home where there was a piano, he would sit down and he would start to play. 
And her job was to jump in and say, stop showing off, stop showing off, um, before it was revealed his lack of playing ability because he only knew the first few bars. Um, so now came the time to actually create our story. And um, the, the people at uh, Story Center Canada um, brought it, did a lot of one-on-one -on -one with us and they would watch and they would listen and then they would make suggestions. But it was always up to me whether or not I would make the changes. Um, this opening line of my story was actually in the middle of the story. And one of them said that it would give a lot more impact if I started with that particular uh, line. And I thought about it and thought, yes, you're right. And so made that change. Um, Another suggestion they made was to add a personal story about my time in the garden with my dad. And so the tale of the, his first tattoo came to be added to the script. Um, they just were helping us make it the best story that it could be. Um, and then they guided us step by step through the process. So first we put down the audio track of us reading our script. And then we put down the track of the music, getting the uh, volume to the right uh, to the right level. And then we started with our images and pictures, figuring out whether we wanted them to be zoomed in or fade out or overlap, how long they were on the screen, whether or not the picture uh, fit with what we were actually saying. Um, how then we had to come up with the title page, the dedication. I mean, the list goes on and on as to creating the story. But um, in the end, um, it uh, it is what you just saw earlier this afternoon, the finished product. Um, in the beginning, I said that I would not probably have done this project had COVID not come along. So um, I am very, very um, thankful and grateful that I was chosen per personally to um, do this particular project because uh, I do now have a legacy that I can pass on to my children and my grandchildren. Um, and I'm also, I'm also very grateful for Compassionate Ottawa that um, they have a vision that uh, they will take these stories and initiate conversations about death and dying. Um, because who knows, had I had that conversation with my father about the impact of his decisions on his grandchildren, my story would have had a very different ending to it. So, well, well thank you. Thank you, Anne, that was, that was great. Um, Do you want to respond to the question about your yeah. experience now? Sure, sure. And that was from uh, Cassandra. Um, and I understood your question, Cassandra. Um, you know, a, a couple of people said to me very early on, uh, man, how could you be so open about what you were sharing there? And, and I, I said, well, I didn't feel like I was being so much more open, but, but it was something that was important to me. And um, because I, I often felt that uh, people don't appreciate how men give support in, in these situations, you know? And as I said in the video, it, it really, it, it ranged from men just giving a nod uh, saying something um, uh, briefly and and sometimes not willing to say anything in the group, but you know approaching me after and, and talk about it, you know. So I thought you know here's a, a chance uh, to have this kind of message out there and, uh, and 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 you know when I did share it with uh, you know former team members and everything. You know the response was, "Yeah, you nailed it. You, 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 you've got us." <laughs> so, so you know, I felt good about that. Yeah, is that uh, kind of what you were looking for, Cassandra? Yeah, good. And good to see you again, by the way, <laughs> uh, as well as Brian and Nancy. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about as well that. Uh, 
when we think of how we might use the stories or how others might use the stories, um, you know, it, it can be as uh, simple as sharing them with the family and friends. That's, that, that, that's very easily done. Uh, we could share them with uh, groups of people that uh, we're in, involved with. Uh, we, we had a couple of examples, um, a cardiac rehab group uh, shared the stories with uh, the members of their education group. And uh, in the example I gave before, when I said I did a session with men, those men were were in the uh, education group and, uh, and uh, as I say, didn't have any difficulty uh, engaging in conversation. Uh, um, so that, that was good. Um, others have shared them, uh, you know, with uh, volunteers and board members at a hospice. Uh, I think Anne is preparing to share them with a grief group. And, uh, Anne did another interesting thing, uh, in her church community. And, and I wonder if you want to just describe how that, um, how that be began and, and, uh, how you, uh, how, how it uh, turned out. Right. Um, I, after I read uh, Kathy's book, I was very excited about it. And I went to our pastoral care team and said, you know, you people need to read this book. It's, it, it's, a, it's a great resource for you. And uh, so uh, one of the priests in our parish turned to me and said, oh, good. Now you can do a Lenten study on this. This would be a great idea. So um, I had to take the book chat, which was for two hours and stretch it into a, a five week Lenten series, which I did. Um, we discussed the book for three different weeks. And then on the fourth week, I shared digital stories and we had discussions about death and dying from them. And, um, and then the last uh, one was on advanced care planning. So, um, but when I got feedback from the group, their favorite uh, part of it was the, uh, the week that we did the digital stories and the discussions that uh, came out of that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a kind of example, and and uh, certainly the the book chat uh, lends itself to adding a couple of stories, you know, to to personalize some of the issues that are in the in the book. Um, um, you know, uh, aside from that, it's it, it's just you know organizations that are running programs already you know, now have access to uh, them as a resource, a few stories that they can incorporate into their, their programming, whether it's advanced care planning, grief, or, uh, or, or caregiving, you know. So, yeah, th to me, those were the examples uh, that I thought of uh, in sharing. Uh, some of you may, uh, I'd appreciate hearing if, if you can imagine how you might use the story. There's a few suggestions in the chat. Um, a lot um, of suggestions relating to incorporating them in a high school curriculum. Um, also a comment that medical students would really uh, getting back to Sue Bailey's comment about the young physician who is really still not very comfortable um, showing these with medical students. Um, somebody said, uh, you know, you could actually show them to your grandparents. They don't like to talk about death and dying often, but it would inspire discussion and they would do anything to help me with school. Perhaps if it even means creating a digital story. <laughs> so yeah, like it's an icebreaker. And uh, as Anne said, you know, had she had an opportunity to have these conversations with her own dad, her story might have ended quite differently. Because, you know, in fact, um, I have a quote from one of the um, 
speakers in our pilot discussions. And he said, you know, um, the person who's died, you know, the, the funeral or the, the way that the community responds is, is not really about the dead person. It, it's about the people who have been left behind and what they need to do for themselves for, for some sense of closure. Um, so here's a comment from Kevin Rath. We use stories extensively to train and equip our PSW and nursing staff mm -hmm. to support clients living with different forms of dementia. This is the first time that I've been exposed to the idea of using personal stories about living with a chronic illness and end of life journey. Sure. And I mean, um, you know, Kevin, if, if these stories would be of any benefit to you in, in the work that you're doing, um, these are um, open access. They're up on the Compassionate Ottawa website and anybody anywhere uh, can use them if, you know, for the purpose that they're intended. And I see Stephanie has just uh, posted the Compassionate Ottawa website um, on uh, the chat, but frankly, if you just Google Compassionate Ottawa, I think it'll come up and uh, it's under resources that you can um, see these digital stories. There yeah. also is a leader's guide do you want to talk a bit more about that? No, or, that's fine. No, there's a leader's no. guide so that if you say, for example, um, Jessica Wyatt wants to do this with her poker club, for example, just, you know, for a change of pace, <laughs> uh, she, she could read the leader's guide and get some suggestions about questions or, you know, kickstarting the, the conversation. Um, uh, I think church groups, I, I think using them in formed groups, like by formed, I mean existing groups would be more successful than sticking up a poster where a bunch of strangers come together. Because, um, you know, as people evolve in their comfort level, um, it's a safer environment. So it, it could, but it could be a church group. It could be a seniors group. It could be a bridge club. It could be a group of volunteers, a cultural group, you know, that um, meet for different things. Uh, any, any type of group or, or an extended family group, you know, show them at Easter. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And I'd like to offer one more comment um, or, or a personal opinion, I guess. The, I find the, the, the personal stories quite impactful. You know, when people uh, choose something that's very important to them and, uh, and, and, and create the story. And, uh, and the, uh, the, there, there's such power, uh, you know, combining the the word and and, the, and their experience. There's a the story about um, an elder who was approached by an author, and the author said, uh, "You know, you you have so much experience and so much wisdom. Would you like to write a book?" And he paused for a minute and he said, "No." I wouldn't because it wouldn't have me in it. <laughs> and I, I, I just, just made you stop and think that that's the power of the, of the personal story. You know, it's, it's not just the script, you know, it's, uh, it's the emotion that uh, someone like Anne or Karen uh, show. It's, um, it, it, it's a more powerful, uh, way of communicating so that's that's my last uh, pitch <laughs> so we're just in the last um a few minutes I'm, I'm going to just make a couple of comments about the evaluation component of the work that uh we did uh, I mean, I'm not going to show you a bunch of data, but I'll explain to you a little bit about how we evaluated them. And then if you have any 
interest in that part of it. Uh, Stephanie's posted my email address or she can find me and I'm happy to talk to anybody about that component. But we did, um, we did three things. Uh, we, um, at the end of each session, so we recruited small groups uh, on Zoom uh, because it was COVID and we couldn't have face-to-face -face meetings. So the groups were anywhere from about five to eight people on Zoom. My criteria was I wanted to see everybody's face. <laughs> so if you have too many, uh, it's difficult. Um, we, um, John facilitated the discussions with the small group and had some opening questions, but really what we were evaluating, it was not, do you like the story? It was, is this story effective as a conversation starter? Do the people share their own stories? Is there evidence that they are changing some of their attitudes or having some insights? So that was the way that we were um, looking at the impact of the stories in terms of people's change of behavior and attitudes. So I observed all of the um, discussions that John facilitated. Uh, then at the end, we gave them a short survey monkey and we asked them on a five point, five point scale to rate things like the digital stories are a valuable resource, one to five, the group discussions held my interest, one to five, the issues we discussed are important to me, the conversation was useful to me. So, you know, we super high ratings. Um, you know, four or five uh, all the time. And then we invited some qualitative comments. So, you know, people said things like dying is part of living, we should not be afraid of death, listening to others' perspectives, realizing that others experience what you have was so valuable to people uh, because people did really uh, share their stories. Um, and then, um, about six weeks following the event, I gave each participant a follow-up phone call, asking them if they had done anything differently. Um, you know, had they shown the stories to someone else, talked to someone else about their experience? You know, people would say things like, you know, particularly in relation to Anne's story, they would say things like, geez, I better, you know, have some conversations with people in my family, you know, loved ones, my children, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, so that's what I want to say about the evaluation. Steph, I think we have like about 60 seconds left and perhaps um, you want to wrap up some way, but, but thank you very much. You've been a very, very engaged uh, group, and and it's been fun to fun to be here with you today. Likewise. Likewise. <laughs> well, I would just like to thank you once again um, on behalf of the center, uh, Sarah, and all of our participants today. Um, it's been a real treat having you all uh, here to present and sharing the digital stories and and so much more with us uh, today. I think it really is exciting just to think about all the many different ways that they may be used and really open up that space, uh, the opportunity for some conversations that are sometimes difficult. Um, and I would encourage everyone as well to check out the, the resources on the Compassionate Ottawa site. And as Mary Lou said, you can view all, view all of the other digital stories there as well. Um, so that's all from me. We do have a Sarah speaker series session scheduled for April 27th, and we will be sending out information around that uh, very soon. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. It was great to, to see you all and spend this time. So take care and have a good afternoon. Tell your story. <laughs>